Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Bienvenidos. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual U Health International Medical Series presentation Advances and Innovations in Orthopedic Surgery. It will feature distinguished orthopedic surgeons from U Health, University of Miami Health System. We want you to know that our experts are ready to take care of your patients in one of our five Florida facilities, either for in-person consultations, second opinion consultations, or even through via telemedicine from the comfort of their home. To refer a patient, please, we invite you to contact U Health International. The number's on your screen, 305-243-9100 by email at uhealthinternational at med.miami.edu or by visiting uhealthinternational.com. Tonight, we will be privileged to hear from three experts who will share emerging orthopedic surgery innovations and how they can best be used to provide the very best care for your patients. Dr. Michele Dapuzzo will present treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis from conservative management to surgery. Dr. Jaime Alberto Carvajal will present robotics in joint replacement surgery. The future is here. And Dr. Victor Hugo Hernandez will present hip and knee replacements, maximizing outcomes at U Health. Now, during the presentation, we will poll the audience on topics relevant to each discussion and what you're hearing. So your responses are anonymous, but we really encourage you to participate and make this an interactive discussion. Now, in addition, throughout the presentation, you also have the opportunity to ask our panelists anonymous questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a second to locate that. It's the two little thought bubbles there on the right hand, probably at the lower part of your screen so that you have a unique opportunity to basically have a peer to peer conversation tonight and enter your questions as you think of them. We're gonna prepare them for the panelists to do at the very end of their presentation. So let's begin with our very first speaker this evening, Dr. Michele Dapuzzo, a board certified orthopedic surgeon and an associate professor of clinical orthopedics at the University of Miami, specializing in hip and knee replacement. He received his medical degree from the Universidad Central de Venezuela, Luis Racetti School of Medicine with honors. He then completed his internship and first half of his residency at the Mayo Clinic and finalized his training at the University of Virginia, followed by a fellowship in adult hip and knee reconstruction at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City, where he was awarded the Clinical Excellence Award and the prestigious John Insall Award by the Knee Society. Tonight, his presentation is going to be treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis from conservative management to surgery. Please welcome Dr. DePuzzo. Take it away, Doc. Thank you, Liana. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michele DePuzzo from the University of Miami. And uh, this evening, I'm going to talk to you about um, a little bit how we go about uh, deciding when to offer uh, hip and knee replacement to our patients and what alternatives do we have before the surgery to treat patients with, uh, with osteoarthritis. So I will propose to you that the decision to decide when to offer the surgery is really a shared decision making between the surgeon and the patient. Uh, hip and knee replacements are an elective surgery, and we want to make sure the patient is part of that decision making process, uh, which is really important for outcomes uh, long term. In, in terms of the, the surgeon part, you know, we need to make sure that we select the, the, the best candidates for this procedure. Uh, we want to make sure that they have uh, a moderate to severe osteoarthritis in the joint. We want to make sure that the source of the pain that they're having, uh, which is usually the main complaint, is not coming from other source. For example, a uh, hip arthritis that presents with knee pain or uh, a lumbar spine issue that presents as hip or knee pain. So it's really important to have uh, the right diagnosis and, in, in the good uh, candidate. Also, we want to make sure we have the correct diagnosis. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about osteoarthritis, primary arthritis of the knee, which is the most common reason why patients get uh, these surgeries. And like I mentioned before, you wanna make sure they have uh, a severe or moderate disease uh, and it's in the right joint and that's the cause of their pain. And then before getting into surgery, you wanna make sure you walk them through all the options that are available to try to address their pain, which again is the main reason why they present to you to try to alleviate the pain. And when the pain becomes an issue for the uh, uh, daily, uh, daily activity, um, for them. 
And so for this purpose, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons have come with clinical guidelines to review all the available literature and have come up with specific recommendations on how to treat uh, patients with hip and knee osteoarthritis. And uh, I'm gonna use them for this presentation to try to summarize uh, all the available evidence. It, it's uh, basically a five-star uh, rating system. And we can group all these different modalities in four different groups. The first one are physical modalities. And among them, we have things like physical therapy, weight loss, hot cold therapy, and acupuncture. Now, physical therapy, there's very good evidence. That it's very highly recommended. It seems to work very well with patients. And it's, it's always one of the first thing I offer my patients when they come in and never had any treatment for the hip or knee arthritis. Weight loss, it's also very important. And uh, this is something that uh, patients think sometimes that they have to lose a lot of weight. Even a few pounds will make a huge difference because of the way the mechanics work in the lower extremities. You can really, these joints can really see much less stress when losing only a few pounds. If the patients are, uh, are severely obese, we always recommend for them to try to lose some weight uh, because uh, they might have some issues when the time of surgery uh, comes around. So this becomes really important. What and cold therapy, usual tensionists don't seem to have any uh, benefit on these patients. We don't uh, usually offer them. However, patients ask if they can use cold or, or hot therapy. I tell them, you know, try them. You know, there's really no downsides of trying them. If they feel they work, you know, uh, by all means, they can try them. There's some literature also on acupuncture. I don't particularly uh, offer it, but if patients ask for it, I'm not opposed to them using them. Again, there's very little uh, downside of them using acupuncture, and there's some evidence that it might work. Recently, cold frequency ablation was approved uh, here in the United States for the treatment of hip and knee uh, osteoarthritic pain. It's basically uh, burning the nerves around these joints to try to improve uh, the pain, and, uh, and it can last up to a year. And uh, we have we use it in some patients uh, as a treatment modality, uh, especially in those patients that, for example, can have surgery, have a lot of pain, and every other alternative has been exhausted. As I said, it was recently approved by the FDA for knee pain due to osteoarthritis. So that was the first group uh, of uh, treatment modalities. The next group is our orthosis. Uh, there's very types of orthosis you can use: uh, cane, splints, fluid orthosis. Really, out of all of them. The only one that has shown to have any uh, evidence of improvement, it, it's uh, the use of canes for both hips and knees. However, uh, I offer it quite often to my patients, but uh, many of them, uh, they don't like to use canes, but uh, definitely is something to keep in the back of your mind as an alternative uh, when you're treating these patients. The third group is oral therapy, meaning medications. There are different types of medications that you can use to treat this chronic condition. Anti-inflammatories is usually the best one. However, if a patient needs to be on chronic anti-inflammatories, you want to make sure that they get monitored uh, on the renal function. Um, acetaminophen in particular doesn't seem to uh, provide uh, much benefit. Um, I often prescribe it uh, in conjunction with anti-inflammatories. seems to work very well in, in, uh, as, as a synergistic combination. And then glucosamine and chondroitin are not recommended for, for, for hitting knee, uh, hip and knee um, osteoarthritis. However, uh, many patients come up to my practice and they, they can swear by these medications. So again, I'm not opposed to them using it. I, I think there's uh, this uh, very little uh, downside of them using them. However, because these are not controlled substances, there's really no regulation as to the, the, the uh, content of, of the glucosamine and chondroitin that they have. And so the, the only some brands uh, are, are recommended if they're, if they're gonna use them. Finally, interjugular injections. And in recent years, there's been a, a very a different type of combinations that you can use. Steroids have been around for over 40 years now. They're very reliable, they're cheap, they work very well. There's evidence that they work. However, you know, I try to offer them to patients when they really uh, need help controlling their pain and the inflammatory don't work, physical therapy doesn't work. I think steroids in these circumstances are, are a good alternative. Hyaluronic acid in general does not seem to be, uh, the, there's no evidence for, for their use and it's been not recommended uh, in patients with hip and knee osteoarthritis. However, some patients come to my clinic, for example, they've used it before, they have good results. In these patients, I tend to use it as long as they work. However, I think it's really important to highlight the fact that you can't just use it on everybody. Uh, it's mostly for patients with knee osteoarthritis, 
They have to have mild to moderate disease. They have to have some cartilage left in order for the hyaluronic acid to work. It's basically a mechanical lubricant. So if you don't have any joint space, the, the chances of it for it working are very, very low. Um, there's uh, there's other uh, injection combinations that um, you know I don't want to I don't want to discuss uh, much right now. Uh, there's sort of new technologies, things like PRP, uh, stem cells. Maybe if there's some questions, we can address those uh, also. Uh, more recently, uh, monoclonal antibodies have also been uh, show uh, uh, some uh, promise in treating these patients. But in general, you, you got to remember every patient is unique. You have a balance the, the potential complications of these patients when considering surgery and also it's really important to address their expectation patient education i think it's key before undergoing surgery they need to understand exactly what they're signing up for you know how their recovery what they can expect uh what kind of pain they, they should expect and i think it really goes a long way to have really good outcomes of these procedures basically we as surgeons we have to put all these pieces together and uh, assemble the, the, the puzzle and try to present uh, the best alternatives to our patients. Now, from the patient perspective, you know, they, they need to feel like they really have tried all surgical options, all the things that we discussed before are really important. It's usually the, the way I explain it to them, it's a journey and they have to go through that journey, feel like they really have tried everything. And when everything else fails and the pain is really affecting their quality of life, that's, that's the best time to consider these type of surgeries. Uh, the surgery, the, the real objective is to treat an irreversible condition, which is arthritis. And it's really designed to address pain, function, and deformity in the lower extremity due to hip and knee uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, again, eliminate pain permanently. Uh, patients need, I need to understand the risk of the surgery and the potential complications, and that, you know what, what are we going to do to try to minimize those? And like I mentioned before, align the expectations. And when that time comes, when the decision has to be made, uh, again, it's, it has to be a shared decision making between the patient and the surgeon, uh, so the patient can have good outcomes and be uh, happy with the uh, with the decision that's being made. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dapuzzo, and uh, that takes us to our very first poll question tonight, and that is. The following options are effective conservative treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis. It's multiple choice. Physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, weight loss, or all of the above. The following options are effective conservative treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis. Now I'll remind you while we're waiting here to see all your answers that you have an opportunity tonight to speak to our experts by asking questions in the Q&A chat feature um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, they will either answer them directly or even live. So take a moment to think of some questions. Let's see how we did on the poll. Let's see how everyone did in the results. And they are paying attention, Dr. Daput. So all of the above. Yes, that's good, that's really good. <laughs> it's what we would expect. All right, well, thank you so much. And now let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Jaime Alberto Carvajal who's an orthopedic surgeon subspecialized in joint reconstruction surgery, currently working as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery in the Miller School of Medicine Department of Orthopedics. His clinical focus and main interest is in robotic assisted joint replacement surgery, primary and complex hip and knee replacement, minimally invasive approaches, and rapid recovery protocols and joint replacement. He's originally from Colombia, graduated from the Jackson Memorial University of Miami Orthopedic Surgery Residency Program, then subspecialized in joint replacement surgery in the University of Alberta, and has been in the academic field at the University of Miami for the last seven years, teaching the orthopedic surgeons of the future. His expertise in robotic surgery has allowed him to be part of training of national and international surgeons in this field. Tonight, he's going to present on robotics in joint replacement surgery, the future's here. Indeed, it is, Dr. Carvajal. Thank you, Liana. Um, I'm very glad to be uh, here today. I want to thank UM to create these spaces for us to share uh, what we're doing here at the University of Miami, and I hope you enjoy uh, the talk. Um, yes. So, uh, we, as Dr. Dapuso was uh, telling us, joint replacement surgery is a life-changing uh, surgical procedure. Um, usually the patients come to us with significant disability, with severe pain. They have um, not a good quality of life. 
and it's all related to pain. So we do know that providing them with hip and knee replacements, we can actually improve their quality of life, make uh, the pain go away and allow them to, you know, re resume social interactions and basically help, um, help them uh, going back to, to their original status. The idea is though, that we don't want to have any complications. So we are working on trying to optimize our surgical technique, our pathways, to make sure that they don't have any, any complications afterwards and they have a great outcome. Um, so in terms of a joint replacement surgery, as I said, everything has to be perfect. We should not miss anything. So, so the patients recover fast and they recover well without any uh, complications. And for that, there are multiple variables that we have to take care of and we want to make sure that, um, that they're all controlled and they're, they're all uh, perfect. So that includes a surgical environment that is safe and that is that we know, um, you know, in the operating room, we have to make sure that we have uh, significant control of the uh, people going in and out, decreasing the number of, pay of uh, persons in the room, um, trying to obviously optimize sterility and keep the operating rooms uh, going. Um, the idea to have dedicated surgical teams that know exactly how the procedures are and to make everything super efficient helps because uh, then we won't, we won't take too long taking, uh, doing a, a hip or a knee replacement and that decreases the risk of infection. Um, obviously, uh, there is data showing that uh, institutions that have a very high um, volume of cases have lower infection rates and lower complication rates. Um, and we want to have an adequate supporting system, having adequate nursing, making sure that the patients are taken care of, make sure that they get called, make sure that they when they have a question, they can, it, it, you know, the questions are answered. That also improves patient satisfaction and also decreases the chances of having complications or not, not doing anything on time uh, to relieve any of those uh, problems. Um, and obviously, we want to make sure that we are giving the patients outstanding prosthesis in prosthetic implants and obviously using um, a um, uh, technology as part of this uh, treatment approach. So this is something that we have been working on and um, I'm gonna share with you currently what we're doing. So for knee replacement, um, I like to tell the patients uh, that we're not replacing the knee. It is more a, a resurfacing procedure. We're only taking the surface out. The knee is still the patient's own. Uh, we just change the surface uh, to a metallic surface, and in between, um, we use a polyethylene liner that will actually um, use, you know, be uh, as a cartilage, um, be working as a cartilage. So the the ligaments, the tendons, the own patella, the own kneecap um, are preserved as well as the tendons. Uh, we do know uh, with research that 20% of uh, patients undergoing knee replacements have had historically. Uh, been dissatisfied with surgery. And that's something that we're working on to try to decrease that number instead of being, tw being 20 to make it 10 or make it five. And the idea how we do this is actually, again, putting the implant in the right place, make, maybe improving the surgical technique um, and improving um, their recovery so they have less pain and have uh, less problems. Um, out of those 20% that are dissatisfied, sometimes they complain of residual pain, some uh, sensation of instability or clicking, um, or that the, feel, the knee doesn't feel normal. And that's why we are coming up with these technologies. Um, every, every knee is unique and every patient is different. We cannot um, try the approach of one knee fits all. Um, so we try to customize uh, surgery to the patient, which I think has a lot to do with patient satisfaction as well. Um, the patient's own knee anatomy has to be recreated in order to make the knee function well. And in order for the ligaments to be nice and tight, both in the inner and the outer side of the knee. Uh, that obviously makes the knee uh, feel more normal and allows the patient to have um, better outcomes. So how were we doing this before? Um, so before we were, uh, the standard way of doing it and this is how still most of the knee replacements are done, um, is using um, jigs in surgery. So you can see in the uh, upper corner, you can see left corner, we see the uh, impl a metallic implant that is pl uh, placed inside the, the femur, then we pin the block, and then we cut the surface of the bone with a saw blade, and then same thing with the tibia, with the shin bone. Uh, in order to do that superficial cut, we had to check a rod all the way down to the leg, and by our own judgment, we were 
making sure that the bone cut was performed in an adequate position and to in, in, in order to you know, make the knee uh, function well. And as you can see in the right side, you see a, um, a graph of a knee replacement after all the cuts are done, then the implants are placed. Now, you now understand how important it is for those cuts to be in the right place, so you don't have, um, so, that, so the, the knee functions well. So what are we doing now? So University of Miami currently has two robotic arms, likely a third one coming up, which, one, which are one of the best robotics um, systems available in joint replacement surgery worldwide. Um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna mention any brand names, but um, obviously each uh, robotic system allows us to um, do exactly what we're, I was describing in the past. So just to give you a, an example of how robotic system works. So um, some, some robotic systems use uh, computer tomography to better anal analyze your anatomy. Some of them use, use ma uh, surface mapping um, while, while in surgery. So either way, your anatomy is actually being checked and actually allows us to recreate that same anatomy. Um, it, ser it, it serves also to make sure that we check the extremity for deformity. Obviously, patients with arthritis have uh, sometimes deformed uh, lower extremities, and we allow that to uh, go back to neutral and, and make sure that the alignment is, is recreated. Um, we check ligament extension, and also we allow, we're allowed to uh, check uh, range of motion uh, during surgery. So this is how the uh, uh, surgery uh, uh, operating room uh, looks. We have a camera, we have a robotic system, and we have a handheld piece, or sometimes even uh, a robotic arm that allows us to, to perform the cuts accurately. Um, we uh, use, have to use pins in both the thigh and the shin bone, um, and then we use structures and arrays so the system can know and recognize where your knee is in space. We then do, for example, in these robotic system, we, we uh, do uh, surface mapping, uh, as I'm gonna show you in this video, uh, basically in surgery with a, a array, we go around the, the surface of the bone and the system creates a 3D model uh, during surgery to allow us to check um, the anatomy of that particular knee. We then assess range of motion and also assess stability of the ligaments uh, prior to perform any cuts. And then this is um, where the surgical planning happens. It tells us how big your bone is, how we will recreate uh, the anatomy, and it allows us to change any component position by one millimeter or one degree, so it's very accurate. Um, and then we perform the bone resection. So basically, this these systems, robotic systems, allows uh, us to remove only the bone that is necessary. And obviously, in the perfect, uh, it's a very precise um, method of cutting the bone. There's no more jigs. There's no more um, uh, eyeballing things. It's more actually the system creating the bone cuts for us. Uh, afterwards, we do check the. Uh, um, uh, implants as well, see how they're behaving, make sure that you have great range of motion, make sure your stability is there, and that allows us to make sure that you're going to be happy with the knee replacement. Now, recently, uh, we have been wearing, uh, using wearable devices. I think Dr. Hernandez will uh, deepen on this, but uh, this is a system that allows to track our patients after surgery to make sure that we know how they're moving the knee, how, how far they're walking, and allows us to make sure that they're actually going in the right direction in recovery. Now, regarding hip replacement, hip replacement, it is a joint replacement. We do take the entire joint out. Uh, we do replace the ball on the hip by a uh, titanium, I'm sorry, a metallic or ceramic head. Um, we use a stem down the thigh bone, down the femur, and then we use a, a artificial cup as well, impacted on the pelvis. So we do change the joint. Um, it's called the surgery of the century uh, because it has shown that it's one of the surgeries that um, improve the most uh, quality of life and decreases the pain on patients. Um, we do have um, excellent patient outcomes. Usually satisfaction rates are very high and um, we have created uh, faster recovery pro protocols for the patients that have um, a surgery so they can start walking quickly and they can uh, rehab and recover faster and they go back to their own uh, activities. Um, one of the things though is if you want the hip replacement to work well, you want to make sure that the implants are placed in the right 
position. If they are placed in a different position, then you might have issues. They might, it might not feel um, right for you, or you might have some clicking, or you might have some uh, discomfort. Now, one of the other things with hip replacement, though, is we can also increase the length, the length of your leg. So obviously, we don't want to have that. Um, but it's, it's known that you know in hip replacement, since you're changing everything, you can actually make the leg longer or shorter. Uh, and also, that has um, you know issues. You can have a hip dislocation. You can have residual pain, and obviously the discomfort of having to use a shoe lift on the other side. So that will be associated with a higher uh, dissatisfaction uh, from the patients. So how to how do we avoid this? Um, so we have to identify the anatomy. We want to make sure that we know where the pelvis is in the space. Sometimes pelvises with arthritis can be tilted to one side or the other. And we want to take that into consideration when you're actually putting a joint replacement. Uh, we do get uh, x-rays or imaging studies before surgery to make sure that the, the implants are placed correctly. And then there's a 3D planning uh, technique um, so we can actually make sure that the implants are placed in the right position. So this is a, 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 a screenshot from one of the templating systems uh, for the uh, robotic heat replacement. So you can see on the left how the pelvis of the patient is uploaded into the system after a CT scan is done. And then we can assess on that particular hip if um, the component, what, what's the position of the cup, um, where is it gonna be, is going to be placed, and, and then also it's going to tell us all the degrees um, where these uh, components are going to go. Um, so during surgery, there is a registration uh, stage where you map the surface of the socket of uh, the pelvic socket, as well as the uh, uh, surface of the bone on the proximal femur. And that allows us to make sure that we, when using the robotic arm, then you can actually use uh, ream and prepare the bone in the right place and make sure that when you're impacting the cup, also the, the, the cup is gonna be placed in the right uh, position. Um, and obviously, as I said, this is gonna be likely associated with decreased uh, risk of complications and better satisfaction. Um, so where are we going next? Uh, we are working on a lab for augmented reality um, for patients and for uh, resident education. Um, and I think, you know, it's all excited, very exciting. I think we're gonna continue growing our technology uh, portion from UM and I'll invite you guys to join us and to um, come um, and see it with your own eyes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It, it, it is so exciting. It does seem like the future has arrived. So let's go right to our second poll question to see how we're all doing. The current technology programs at the Joint Replacement Division at the University of Miami include all of the following except. So you're gonna choose one of these. A robotic knee replacement surgery, B, wearable devices for patient follow-up, C, nanotechnology, and D, robotic hip replacement surgery. The current technology programs at the Joint Replacement Division at the University of Miami include all of the following except. So let's see how we're all doing. And a couple of questions are coming over the Q&A box. So we encourage you to continue to send those in because tonight is a unique opportunity to speak to the top experts in the field here at UHealth and your peers. How did we do? Uh, I think they got that one right, Dr. Carvajal. Nanotechnology yes. is the yes, exception. Excellent. All right, well, thanks for that presentation. And uh, we are gonna go right to our final speaker of the evening, who is Dr. Victor Hugo Hernandez, Associate Professor of Orthopedics and Chief of Adult Reconstruction and Joint Replacement Division at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Hernandez is devoted to advancing the field of orthopedic surgery and has contributed over 50 original peer-reviewed scientific articles to medical literature and has authored book chapters in orthopedic surgical text. He does hip and knee joint reconstruction, including anterior hip approach, muscle sparing techniques, bilateral simultaneous knee and hip replacement, and complex revision, as well as patellofemoral and unicompartmental arthroplasty. Dr. Hernandez is an expert in robotics, navigation, and the use of wearer technology 
we'll hear more about that. His research has been showcased in regional, national, and international orthopedic scientific meetings on over 150 occasions. Tonight, he is going to present hip and knee replacements, maximizing outcomes at UHealth. Please welcome Dr. Hernandez. Thank you, Eliana. And again, everybody, welcome to our webcasting. Uh, I'm gonna kind of surround what my partners has explained to you. And I'm gonna go in very detail about what we do for the patient when it comes into surgery. So joint replacement, as everybody knows, is a very successful surgery. They provide excellent pain relief, excellent function recovery, and the durability, which was one of the questions that they were asking, nowadays with the materials we are using it, it can last from 25 to 30 years. And most of the hip replacement can have 95% of uh, a high satisfaction after 25 years. So it's a very cost-effective surgery. Here at U Health, as you can know, we are specialized in joint replacement, although their expertise in what we do. And we have a study in details about how we can improve outcomes. So Dr. Carvajal explained a little bit what's a hip replacement. So normally it's, there's different uh, reasons why you ended up having a hip or a knee replacement, but most of the people we have because osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis. So normally what we do is we take out on the hip, the femoral head, and we replace it with uh, prosthetic thesis that it's most of the time made out of ceramic and plastic. We do have different ways to do the surgery. We can use the anterior approach, posterior approach, or lateral approach. And we here, we can have access to all of that. Most of my surgeries are done through anterior approach because it's kind of the new kid in the block and patients uh, for the early recovery, it will make a, 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 a change in terms of recovery for these patients but also we can provide posterior approach with minimally invasive surgery that allows the patient to go home the same day as well. Knee replacement is pretty much similar, but a knee replacement, it's more like a capping that actually taking the whole knee out and replaces like on the hip replacement. And that allows the patient to recover faster. And on the knee replacement, we can also correct the formic. So some patients come with both legs, some patients go uh, and we can actually take those uh, knee and correct it using all the uh, computers and robotics that we have access to it. We also, as you mentioned, Liana, we can do replacement on compartments. And if a patient like in this picture has medial compartmental arthritis, we also can replace just this this medial compartment side or the patellofemoral joint on patients that has patellofemoral disease. And that allows the patient to recover a little faster and have a more natural knee after uh, the joint replacement. So here, uh, with the use of technology, but all these technology and surgical factors, there's another factor that can affect the results. And is patient motivation, education, and the clinical pathway that we use during surgery and after surgery to determine pain control and recovery. We have talked about anterior approach, muscle sparing surgery and need and hip replacement that also can help. So for us here at UM, it's very important to have a comprehensive program. And we have developed this program. And within the program, we involve the patient, the family, the surgeon. We have a full team of anesthesia that is called UPAC. We have the medical service that is involved. We have the rehab service and we have the social service to allow the patient to recover faster. And we started working on this in 2015. And in 2016, our program received a national award that is an innovation grant award that was given to our comprehensive joint replacement team, but you, you trust, which is uh, a national recognized uh, entity in terms of innovation grants. So the goals of our program is to increase the functional return, decrease the length of stay of the patient in the hospital, decrease the cost to the health system and decrease the suffering of the patient but increasing the quality of the results. And this cannot be done if we don't have a patient motivation. And that's the important part of our program is because we take the patient anxiety, fear and pain and we are very realistic about the expectation of the patient. We do this. 
to a preoperative joint class that we have transferred from being uh, from in person to a Zoom meeting that we have even with international patients. So from our practice, around 15% of our practice come from international patients. So we have developed this special program from this, from this particular population or patient that lives out of Miami and doesn't wanna come and spend uh, a week or two weeks within the hospital doing preoperative tests and stuff. So within the class, we spend around an hour with the patient. We provide with videos, how to prepare for the surgery, what to expect for the surgery and after surgery. And most of the patient will return home either the same day or next day to the hospital. The question is, is it safe to discharge patients early? We have done plenty of research and we know most of the patient, the risk why a patient will stay in the hospital longer. So we have developed a preoperative team with the anesthesia as well as our cardiologists. So we have Dr. Delgado and Dr. Osman who provides telemedicine visits to this patient. And we go over what we call the preoperative risk stratification. So normally these patients are stratified for renal, dementia, cardiac, pulmonary, or urinary retention. And these are the main causes why a patient will stay in the hospital. After our renal or uh, risk stratification, we can actually decrease stuff that can affect these patients. And we have particularly patient-oriented post-operative. For example, if a patient is a renal risk, we try to prevent renal drugs. So we don't use Toradol, we don't use anti-inflammatories, even from anesthesia is completely different from a patient that doesn't have the renal risk. If a patient has pulmonary risk, we increase our incentive spirometry, we have, we pray, uh, we try to get that patient within two, three hours after surgery out of bed. We try to mobilize that patient. So it's very patient oriented this. And what we want is after surgery, this patient to feel freedom and be able to return to activities of daily living. So we want those patients to have same day mobilization with physical therapy. One of the reasons why we can reach out this is we try to eliminate high potential analysis after surgery. So we work with these protocols. We also have something we have developed at UM, which is the life skill gene. It's like a house within our recovery. We take the patients with PT, which is physical therapy and occupational therapy. And we have a car simulator. We have a kitchen, we have a bed, we have a stairs, we have a bathroom. So occupational therapy takes, takes this patient and spend a lot of time in between one to three hours, depends on the uh, patients. And we teach them how to behave. So we take the fear out of this and we show them that after surgery, um, normally within three hours uh, in the afternoon, or if the patient's a little behind, we keep it overnight. And then the next day we do another two sessions of physical therapy and we can show that the patient is gonna survive at home. And we provide the patient with education of videos that he can follow at home. And one of the main reasons that we can do this is to control the pain. So pain, as everybody know, is before, and before I mean, three years, five years ago, we didn't have the ERAS protocol that we have today. And we haven't learned what we have learned today. And we know that pain has memory. So we use drugs that act to delete these pain memories. We have drug that acts a local, and we have drug that goes into the spinoclamic tract. So using different drugs, we try to prevent the use of narcotics. And using this drug, we have pretty much control of the pain. And patient is able to return to home and do activities, including physical therapy without major pain. We have published our data in JBJS, which is the main national uh, and international journal of bone and joint replacement surgery. And we actually recently uh, provide our uh, protocols for concert, current constant review on how to control. And I'm more than happy to share it to anyone that, want, that wants to read our protocols, how you can do it. So post-op, after using this multimodal pain management, we don't use PCP, PCAs, we don't use narcotics. We try to use Celebrex, Tylenol, Tramadol, drugs that goes into the system and help with the patient uh, pain control. Then after surgery, we try to get that patient back home and for international patients and patients that lease uh, on, on other communities, not close to Miami, we need a device that track, coach, and monitor the patient after surgery. And that's what we developed 
And we are part of the developer group from this device. This is a world device, it's called the track patch. This device actually is it's able to record the motion, the step that the patient does. It goes into the cloud and I can see on a daily basis how the patients behave after surgery. So normally the patient attached in the morning is able to do exercise and the device will record. Also this device, this is what I'm gonna uh, receive from my iPhone. I can see how the brain of motion of the patient is. I can place goals for the patient and exercise the patient in his iPhone can actually follow uh, the exercise and how to do it. And the device will teach you how to perfectly do the exercise. And if, if we need to increase the amount of motion, we can actually do it. And the patient normally on their device will see how he's recovering as well. So for me, it's an important tool because it allows to see every one of my patients, see which one are behind. It will give me kind of a red flag and I can call directly to this patient. They can send me by encrypted uh, uh, pictures of the wound. If they have any concerns about the wound, they can have, send me texts. So they, the patient feels we have in a daily basis contact. And I can see how the patient progress in terms of motion as well uh, exercise, even measure temperature. So if a patient is increasing temperature, we can capture it early and ask the patient to either calm or we can have a telemedicine visit and see how the patient is controlling the pain and other uh, activities of daily living, including exercise. We have data, we have published this data that increased the range of motion of the patient after surgery. Um, it decreased the pain. It decreased something we call manipulation under anesthesia after surgery. And we are gonna present this data at the Academy this year, the Orthopedic Academy. So we are the only clinical trial actually using wearable devices to measure this. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of my group that we are actually leading this uh, clinical trial to demonstrate that this can help the patients to recover faster. Not only on that, and there's a lot of questions on, on the chat about uh, how to improve mental health, how to improve patients with difficult comorbidities. Our group have published over 60 papers about uh, how to improve recovery. So everything that we do at U Health has been published and is data that we track on a daily basis and is based on research evidence. So everything that we do, there's a reason why we are doing it here. And it's a strategy that we have, it's a, not only the multimodal pain management control, it's a thin approach. We work together, surgeons, anesthesia, pharmacology, PT, nurses, even psychology, to get the patients back into their life. And that's why we do the surgery. So we want those patients to go back to activities of daily living and enjoy life again. Excellent, thank you so very much. That was, uh, again, more eye-opening. So let's go right into our final poll question so that then we can launch into the Q&A. And that is the rapid recovery protocols from joint replacement at UHealth will include all of these except, so it's another except question. One of these does not belong with the others. Robotics, stem cells, multimodal pain management, risk stratification protocols, outpatient surgery. The rapid recovery protocols from joint replacement at UHealth will include all of these except. Take a close look at this because it could throw us. Robotic stem cells, multimodal pain management, risk stratification protocols, or outpatient surgery. Let's wait a few seconds and we do have a few questions that are open and we'll, I'm sure our experts will address. So did they get that right, Dr. Hernandez? Is it stem cells? Yeah, we don't, we don't have enough evidence based on stem cells to include in our uh, surgery process. Um, we can probably discuss a little bit more in question and answer about the use of stem cells. And I think Dr. Dapuso will guide us a little bit about why we don't use stem cells until today. I'm not telling it's, it's a, the wrong choice. Maybe there's a future on it but we don't have the research of the evidence to, to make that decision. Okay, perfect. So that's the perfect segue to Dr. Carvajal, who will be our moderator for the questions, uh, the whole session, along with Dr. Dapuzzo and Dr. Hernandez. So Dr. Carvajal, it's all yours. 
Thank you, Eliana. So yes, we have uh, plenty of questions. Very interesting. Um, uh, and we would like to start with the first one for Dr. Dapuso. So it says um, that a person has been working with another doctor who said that the joint replacements last for five to 10 years, um, or sometimes even more. Said so many conditions apply for these to last that long or short. Is it viable for patients that from a young age have knee replacements to have two or more knee replacements a lot of the lifespan? You need to uh, unmute Dr. Depuzzo. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very common question. It's a good question. Uh, you know, if you look at all the reasons why arthroplasty uh, fail, and you group them together, you know, that's, you know, fractures, loosening, wear of the, of the liner, you put them all together. In general, you know, you have about a 1% community rate of failure a year after year, meaning, you know, 10 years, you expect 90% of the patients to still have a well-functioning joint replacement, you know, 80% at 20 years. And so uh, for young patients in particular, the, the real question is, you know, how long that plastic is gonna last, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a real concern. Because uh, obviously the more you use it, especially if you have to use it for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, and the chance of that plastic right now are higher and higher. With the new plastic that we have now, when we try to measure at 20 years, which is the longest that we've studied so far with the new plastics, and we can barely measure anywhere. So we expect reasonably those prices, plastics to last you know, 20, 30 uh, years at, at least. Uh, but uh, that's a really good question. Now, you, like Dr. Carvajal you know, wrote, wrote on the um, answer there, and we have a, a young patient that uh, needs a joint replacement, you know, I mean, you really, I mean, that's a first procedure that's going to really give you quality of life. And, uh, you know, obviously the younger you do it, the more likely you have to have a second procedure down the line. But then you also have to take into account all those years of quality of life that you're gaining uh, from having the surgery. Excellent, uh, Dr. Dapuso. Um, I have another question for Dr. Hernandez. It says, according to the literature, Non-operative factors such as mental health and expectations have been strongly related to patient satisfaction. How do you address those factors to improve patient satisfaction? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, we actually, two years ago, we published a paper where we study how to improve mental health. So there's, uh, there's different, when we talk about mental health, it can be depression, anxiety, it can be bipolar disorder. There's, there's, there's multiple different environments that we can treat. Normally on patients that has diagnosis and treatment, we even the same way we ask for a cardiology clearance, I normally contact or we normally try to contact the psychiatry who's managing these disorders. Because for hip replacement, it's a little easy to recover, but for knee replacement, it's a little tougher because knees hurts more and takes a little longer to recover than a hip replacement. So most of those patients, we get in contact with the psychiatry and we try to improve their status, for example, for bipolar, schizophrenic disorders, and they normally do well for recovery if we are working in conjunction with the psychiatry. So if the patient doesn't have a diagnosis and we know he may need a di uh, diagnosis, we can provide a new help with our psychiatry department. Someone can help us to get and optimize this patient into surgery. Mental health like depression and anxiety also goes along with pain control. So it's very important for these patients and some of these patients will benefit our previous intervention towards the pain. Like for example, Dr. Dapuso was talking about the use of radiofrequency ablation. So normally these are patients that are high narcotic user, has difficulty controlling the pain. So these patients, we can actually take it before surgery, do some uh, uh, radiofrequency ablation and try to control a little better the pain. So there's a lot of things we do for this particular population. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Um, I do have a question from the audience regarding robotics. So I'm going to take that. It says, can you please elaborate on outcomes of robotic versus non-robotic knee replacement surgery, quality of life, complication rates, and other indications? So that's a great question. Um, and 
is there are two ways of looking at this question. Uh, one, one people that do a lot of robotics um, obviously are biased saying that robotics are the best, but the, the, the doctors that don't do a lot of robotics say there's no difference. There's a lot of meta-analysis meta coming out um, showing that there is improved patient satisfaction. The, the patient reported outcomes are uh, better. And I think we're, we're haven't looked yet and it's just because we're lacking long-term data, it's on survival. So um, I think if you put all the implants in the right place and they're not tilted to one side or the other, even by a degree, I'm expecting that those implants will last longer. So I think so survival is gonna be important when we see these uh, implants that are placed today, 20 years from now, I think that the, the, the number of revisions is gonna come down. And I think that's one of the important things to um, show up. That there is improvement in patient reported outcomes as well without increasing the complication rates during surgery. Um, I have another pay, uh, question for uh, Dr. Lapuso. Um, it says, what type of patient will typically qualify to receive knee intraarticular hyaluronic acid injections? Yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, I, I typically in my practice, and this varies uh, across the practices, but uh, I, don't give, I don't offer as a first uh, line of treatment. Uh, if a patient already has been, as usual before, with good results, I'll, I'll continue using it. Uh, I'll use it only for patients with knee osteoarthritis. In the hip, it's really difficult because the, the joint space is very, very small. Um, and then it has to be mild to moderate osteoarthritis. You have to have some joint space uh, for the uh, HA to, to lubricate. So in severe cases, I wouldn't even consider it. Excellent. Um, I have a question for Dr. Hernandez. Does not doing a corrective osteotomy for genovagus and varus deformities affect the longevity of the knee replacement? And if so, at what degree? That's an excellent question. And I know there's a lot of uh, people that are actually watching us from South America, Latin America. Uh, osteotomies in Latin America, uh, it's, it's a big surgery. And it's for young patients to kind of buy time before the knee replacement. We have learned that osteotomies, it will make a little more difficult for the total knee replacement it will not affect the longevity, but it will do the surgery a little more challenge. Nowadays, with the advantage of partial knee replacement, we can, some of those patients, we can actually get them within that group and perform a partial knee replacement and they will recover faster. And, and normally the partial knee replacement should last in between 10 to 15 years if you do the right patient. And those knee replacement, partial knee replacement are easy to convert that uh, previous osteotomy patient because the osteotomy will involve having plates and screws. So some of the time we have to remove. Now that we have robotics technology, that also will help with this type of surgeries because a lot of the time we can plan before surgery, know where we're going to position that implant and we can prevent or we can avoid removing some of the previous implant and do the surgery a little easier for us. But yeah, that's a great question. And I know we're getting very scholarly as this is what this is about. For questions that people have, what is a young patient these days with such an active lifestyle that people have 60s, 70s, 80s? So under 50, is that what you would consider a younger patient? Well, I'll tell you, it really depends on the patient. You know, I have some, you know, 70 year old patients that are super active. And so age is just a part of the equation, right? But then the activity level also plays into it significantly as well. So just, yeah, go ahead, Jaime. No, I have another question for Dr. Lapuz. So. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit to uh, the question from Liliana. So, we nowadays with the technology and the advance on the materials that we use and have greater results, we have access also to a cementless implant on knee replacement and cementless implant in hip replacement that allows the bone to grow within the prosthesis. Those implants, we don't have the long-term data, but as we have seen for short to medium, and then medium is 10 to 15 years, they are performing better than the old implants we used to have. 
So for those patients normally, particularly, I use cementless knees prosthesis and they most likely are gonna last longer. We don't have the data yet, but that's our expectation. So as, as the PUSO say, age is, is very different. We have done hip replacement, um, very young patients, including teenagers for different reasons with excellent results. As, as we have done knee replacement on patients on the 40s with excellent results as well. So it depends, each one patient is individual. And, and the goal for this is to take the patient, treat it in a way that you can delay a little bit the surgery, but not to a point that you're actually gonna do more damage at the point that some of the people that wait too long for the surgery don't recover as well as other people that didn't wait. So we have forms today that we can use. We, we use WOMAC scores, scores that we can take the patient. It's called patient-oriented scores. And we can timing the perfect timing for the patient to get surgery and get well from the surgery. Excellent. Um, one question for Dr. Lapuso is, um, walking or exercising prior to surgery, could that make my arthritis worse? And what is your opinion? No, that's a, that's a great, that's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, a lot of patients come in with a misconception that more activity will damage their joint further, which is, it couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I encourage them to remain active. I mean, the, the, the only way the, the, the joint has to get nutrients is by motion. And so, you know, I try to steer a little bit away of impact activities in general, but, you know, uh, certainly remaining active is really important, especially as you age, it becomes even more so. Um, and also you know, that, will, that will maintain muscle strength, which is so important for many other reasons. So activity is something that I would recommend uh, despite of the arthritis for sure. Excellent. I have two uh, questions about robotics that I'm going to try to combine in one. Uh, one is which navigation system has demonstrated to be superior for knee replacement, surface mapping versus CT? Um, and the other question in that regard is what factors or scenarios will us doctor take into consideration to determine if a patient is candidate for robotic surgery or manual standard surgery? So they're both great questions. Um, I think there is not a single study still showing that there is one um, uh, technology or one method better than the other. I can you know, speak to you um, based on, on experience. And I do think CT scans can be um, slightly more accurate in patients that have severe deformity, um, especially because they can actually track the entire lower extremity. But in terms of surf surface mapping, um, it is very accurate as well. You just have to map the surface very well. So in, in, in the sense of CT scans, the, all the data is already obtained by the CT scan. You do have a little bit of a higher radiation dose when you get the CT scan. Uh, when you do the surface mapping, you don't, you don't have to have the CT scan, so you don't have to do, uh, you don't have to have the radiation, but it's, uh, it is it, dependent on who is mapping the bone surface. So you don't want to be, you can have inac you know, inaccurate uh, points and then it can throw you off. Now, regarding what patient is candidate for robotic surgery, I think every patient is candidate for robotic surgery. Um, I think the, I'll say the more simple arthritis uh, benefits from uh, the robotic surgery, uh, because obviously you're adding precision and adding data that you can um, use during surgery to make sure that the knee replacement is in the right uh, place or the hip replacement. Um, and when you get to more complex cases, you can actually use robotics as well to make sure that you correct the deformities when you have severe deformities in knee replacement, or even with uh, patients with uh, uh, difficult uh, hips with uh, a lot of deformity uh, also allows us to make sure that the implants are placed in the right uh, position and they won't impinge with the bony uh, surfaces. So I think every patient is a candidate uh, for uh, joint replacement uh, uh, through robotic systems. Um, I have a, another question for uh, Dr. Hernandez. Um, can I perform sports after my joint replacement? And if so, what are my limitations? Yeah, so I, I, we do this surgery to take the patient back into life. And, uh, and the question is, what type of sports I allow my patients? I allow my patients to go back to normal life 
do whatever they want to do, they need to know that they have a mechanical device that it will last the base on weight and activities. So the more active you are, the faster this device is gonna wear off. Normally, we, we expect for a device to wear off within 25 to 30 years. So patients that are very active and do a lot of sports like running, jogging, marathons, stuff like that, I normally recommend for them to be follow every year, at least for the first five years. So on close follow-up, we can actually measure how much is wearing off year by year, and we can compare, and we can see if the patient is wearing faster than normal or not. And those patients, if they were in faster than normal, I will probably tell, hey, you're doing too much, or you're gaining too much weight, or, or we can kind of fine tune it. On patients that doesn't wear off that enough, we continue doing their life. They need to know that high impact sports like jumping, basketball, those are actually the worst sports to do after a, a knee or a hip replacement. It's not that they cannot do it, but those are the ones that will work the most when you have high impact. So those are exercises that normally I tell them, try to avoid, but if they play basketball, and they love basketball, I'm not gonna stop to do it. We just follow closer. Uh, the other thing is other high risk sport or ex sport that people call nowadays in young people like type, like uh, motorcycle, stuff like that. They need to know that if there's a fracture around a prosthesis is a different fracture than just from regular fracture around the hip or the knee. So they can do it and I will not be the one to tell them not to do it because that was the point of surgery to return to life but they need to be aware that there are some risks involved. Excellent. Um, I have another very important, uh, interesting question for Dr. Dapuso. It says, what options could be offered for patients that have osteopetrosis or osteoporosis? You know, patients with dense or light bones uh, that tend to get fractured very easily during uh, any physical activity. That's a good question. Um, let me address uh, osteoporosis, which is uh, so much common, and osteoporosis is a rare condition. But, uh, you know, I think as orthopedic surgeons and stewards of bones in general, we, we really ought to be looking for osteoporosis in, in our patients. And, and, and I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, you know, so we always try to, you know, make sure, especially in females over 65, you know, that they get their uh, densitometry. Uh, and, and then if they don't have treatment, and they have um, osteopenia or osteoporosis that they really should be treated uh, for it to decrease the risk of, of fracture. Uh, you know, when we're doing these procedures, we always have options to try to address uh, if, if we have trouble optimizing the osteoporosis before the surgery, we can always use different implants, cement, things like that. But ideally, you wanna try to optimize that before the surgery as much as possible. Excellent. Um, one question for Dr. Hernandez. I am afraid to go home the same day of surgery. How would you help me in that regard? So that's, that's why it's important, the preoperative class. In the preoperative class, we have our nurse practitioner, our physical therapy people that is going to reach out to you and it's going to try to find out what are the obstacles that you're going to have to go back to home. Not every patient is a candidate to go home the same day. So based on medical clearance, based on our PT evaluation, we make a decision if the patient is ready to go home. So most of the people that do outpatient surgery are patients that has no big medical comorbidities, for example, cardiac patient that has previous myocardial infarctions, previous strokes, those are patients that we keep in the hospital because medical reason, we wanna make sure these patients are doing well. But patients are a candidate that doesn't have social support at home. Maybe those are another patient that we wanna make sure they're performing well. So normally after surgery, we take the patient and there's three things that the patient needs to do before we make a decision. So normally PT will ask the patient to independently walk in a hundred feet, going into the bathroom and pee because most of these surgeries are done with spinal anesthesia 
and the bladder will come. Sometimes it takes a little time for the bladder to recover. So patient can have urinary retention and we don't want that patient going home and come back in the middle of the night with urinary retention. So we wanna make sure the bladder is working and then doing some stirs. If the patient does the three of them, it's ready to go home. If the patient is afraid, we don't gonna take the patient and, and send it to the streets. If the patient is afraid because he feels it's not yet ready, we keep the patient. There's no problem keeping the patient overnight and show them that they're gonna do well. So a lot of patients, they came and say, hey, I'm gonna do all patient, but we keep them if, if there's any reason they, they feel they're not gonna make it at home. Uh, a lot of time also for a support, if for any reason the patient doesn't do what we need to do, we normally keep patients up to three days after surgery. And if the patient is still very behind or doesn't have social support, those are patients that normally we work really well with rehab centers around and we send to acute rehab centers. But that has been probably for the past five years, less than 5% of our population. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think we have a constraint of time. I'm gonna answer the last question of the session and then I'll let Ileana wrap up the, the webinar. So it says, what is something unique about UM orthopedics uh, offering to the patients? So, I mean, it, again, it's a great question and allows us to give a closure to this webinar. So I think, you know, as we spoke tonight, um, one of the main things we have specialized orthopedic surgeons that do this a lot. So it's a high volume center um, that is using high technological um, uh, robotic systems and they're providing the patients with a great care. Um, obviously they're bilingual services and um, also um, there is uh, all this infrastructure for uh, patient outcomes and to follow our patients closely and make sure that they do well. Um, and I think that's that's basically uh, the most important, I think, about UM Orthopedics. And as I said before, we're more than happy to treat you um, here at UM. Thank you. Yes, doctors, thank you. And I think it was in Dr. Hernandez's presentation that he talked about the virtual patient support that you offer globally. And obviously, since we're talking to colleagues from all over the world, their patients would be coming uh, back and forth or here for surgery, perhaps returning for that kind of patient support. Could you elaborate just a touch on that again, what you offer? Yeah, so, so and that's probably a question that hasn't come out, but uh, because we have done a lot of on international patients, uh, we also, these patients normally stay for a week to two weeks. So patients come, we can, within the first week, we can set up everything we can do a lot of through telemedicine and virtual like medical treatments. We can actually ask the patient to take labs, EKGs, chest X-rays on their country or where they live. And then they send us and we can work on telemedicine for medical treatments for these patients. Then when the patient, everything is set up, normally nowadays we have to do the COVID around 24 to 40 hours before surgery. But we work in a way, we have a surgical scheduler, which is Carmen, is fantastic. She will coordinate with international. And we bring the patient, we do the test, everything within the same week, we do the surgery. And then normally the patient is stay for a week or two weeks and depends on the healing process, that patient within two weeks can return home. Yes, it's amazing. And some of the patients uh, wonder, when can I walk? Well, isn't it immediately after surgery that they actually walk? You know, that's the new 21st century model, isn't it? Yeah, patients walk within a couple of hours after surgery. And that's one of the goals is to walk the patient, get out of bed, because it will not only improve the recovery, but decrease the risk of complications like DVTs and thrombos. Yeah. Well, welcome to the 21st century. Uh, you gentlemen are at the top of your field and you proved it tonight. And I think your colleagues uh, all over the world got a lot out of this. I certainly always do and privileged to do so. Thanks so much. Our program has indeed come to an end. We took it a little 10 minutes over the hour just so that we could get all these incredible questions in. We thank our interactive audience. We thank all three of, of you. you really opened our eyes tonight. Uh, and we at the University of Miami Health System want everyone to know that we're ready to care for your patients. Uh, we ask you to visit you, 
health.org to learn more about the topics covered tonight or youhealthinternational.com to refer your patients for virtual or in-person appointments. And uh, we certainly hope you enjoy tonight's program. Please complete the survey at the end of this chat to give us feedback on future experiences. And I remind you that you should be receiving a video of this webinar, those of all of you who participated uh, in your mail inbox very shortly. So good night to all of our experts. Good night to all of you all over the world. Buenas noches. We'll see you all again and please stay safe out there.